everybody, and welcome to another edition of Spiteful Stories. I'm your host, Marty, as always. Sorry I missed a week last week. A week. I missed a day last week. Uh, I had a power outage. Put me way behind. Power's back on. We're back in business. Back for another Spiteful Stories tale. Uh, I'm working on the book. I'm redoing my blog a little bit. If you follow my blog this Thursday, I got a little announcement. It's going to give me more time to work on the book. So I'm hoping to have some more news about that. I've kind of stalled out at seven chapters. Haven't really done anything for a couple months, uh, but I want to get back on that. My goal is to have the book out by January of next year, of 2025. That's going to be the uh, 15th anniversary when I did my 365 bars blog. So that's kind of a milestone. That's the thing that really has gotten the most attention of anything I've ever done. So that's the update with the book. On here, we're talking about my writing career right now in New York and talking about uh, my fanzine fish wrap. Uh, here, here's the black and white version of it, which we did this from 94 to 96. And basically, if you haven't watched this before, go back and watch them all. But fish wrap was basically me making fun and just taking the living piss out of all publications, writers, editors. And it got to be pretty well known, especially in New York, but really in the whole fanzine world. I've always been really proud of this. We did it from 94 to 2001. 94 to 96, we did in this black and white version. And then, as I said in the last episode, we went to color, 48 pages. There's Bob Guccione, the spin doctor. He was the publisher and editor of Spin at the time. Did an interview with him. This is our first color one. And with this one, it started selling really well. With this one, too, we started, we had we had one distribution deal in the beginning for the black and white. For this one, we started, we went with big top publishing services. They were out of San Francisco. Basically, three people ran and did all the work there, but they did a great job. Ellen, uh, Tracy, and Tom. So if you're watching by any chance, thanks, guys. Uh, they really did a great job with it. I think now for the color one, we put out like 3,000 of them, and I think we sold like a couple thousand because we started getting some press. Uh, maybe in the next issue, I'll tell about some more of the press that we got. I've talked about before we got, we got in Sassy and Spin with the black and white version, and I'll tell some more. After we went color, we got even more press. So there's the Bob issue. I should just show, I just found, I don't have all the issues. I'll show you uh, some covers of the color version. And then I want to tell some store fish wrap stories. This is one we did uh, Mad Magazine. I did an interview with the editors and some of the people that worked there. Went to their offices, took photos. That was cool, me being a lifelong Mad fan since a little kid. So that was a lot of fun for me. Uh, here's one with... Conan O'Brien on the cover. It was mild-mannered talk show host or commie rat bastard. You make the call. I made fun of a Conan O'Brien interview there. Whoops, almost dropped something here in this one. And these are all 48 pages. Uh, there was an interview with Joe Queenan that I did in here. Uh, here's a question and answer thing. Is, is fe feminism dead? Vanity Fair's pictorial of Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. Uh, just we did a lot of silly stuff. Here's one with Madonna on the cover that we put. Rolling Stone always had a hot issue, so we did a snot issue. And we did all kinds of jokey stuff about it. We did Madonna, she snot, all that. Uh, what else did we do in this? Uh, behind the mucus. <laughs> and uh we just really did some crazy stuff in here um we we did got snot there was craig kilborn back when he was doing the uh um daily show what's hot and what's snot <clears throat> so anyway the one that i want to talk about today though is this one our just say dope issue we did the cover story. I did an interview with John Holmstrom and Stephen Hager. John was the publisher of High Times. Stephen Hager was the uh, editor. And the other thing that we did was an oral history of the book Please Kill Me by Legs McNeil and Jillian McCain. Well, way back in 1976, John and Legs, I have trouble pointing because you have to go the opposite way on the screen when you're filming. John, John and Legs, uh, they started a magazine in 1976 called Punk. 
I was a senior in high school. It was all about punk rock. And the two of them did it along with another guy, Jed Dunn. He was more of the business guy. John was more or less the editor. He did the hand lettering. He did the cartooning. I'll put up a, a picture. I don't, sadly, I don't have any copies, but um, he did all the drawing, the cartooning. John, John's a great cartoonist. And he did the first cover, Lou Reed. Uh, and I, re I used to buy that here at Co-op Records on Main Street. I remember reading it like in senior year in high school and thinking, man, I can't believe it. Legs was the resident punk. He was more of the social guy. He was out drinking with the bands. Uh, and I remember reading this thing. It, it lasted for three years. I think it went from 76 to 79. And I read every issue. And I always was amazed and also inspired that they just kind of did their own magazine and said, you know what? Fuck this publishing world. We'll do it ourselves, which is what I did with Fish Rap. And so with this issue, I don't think I had met John, but I did. I, I actually met Legs. Put this down because I want to hold something else up. I met or talked to Legs on the phone before I moved to New York. In 93, there was a magazine called Nerve. This is it right here. And it came out. Sometime in 93, I think like in the winter, and Legs was the editor of it. And I remembered his name from Punk. And CNN had a thing on it with an interview with Legs. And I thought, I'll have to go out and get that. So I went out, and in it, I think in this one they have one too, if I can find it. Oh, yeah. They had a uh, – it said that they were looking – where is it now? Oh, here. They're looking for a few writers a uh, few good, what does it say? I got a uh, nerve is looking for a few good writers. And then I had a place to send in your ideas. So I sent in some ideas, addressed it to legs, said I'm a former punk fan. And I think he liked that. And he actually called me back. We talked on the phone. And I said, yeah, you know, I used to read punk magazine. And by then I knew I was moving to New York. I think this is probably like in April or May when I decided, I said, you know, I'm moving to New York. He's like, oh, you're kidding me. We'll have to get together. And so I pitched him a couple ideas and they ran. This ran a couple months before I moved to New York. One of the ideas was called Stone Cold Crazy. See my byline in there by Marty Wambacher. Uh, it was all about Bill Wyman's book, Stone Alone. Which jokingly, the book was just all pretty much focused on every woman he had ever had sex with. And Bill Wyman had a lot of sex through the years, but it's like every page is a different groupie, girlfriend, girl, wife of a friend. So I did a thing on that, joked on that, and I also did The History of Rock in 250 Words. I did like a Cliff Notes edition of The History of Rock, and Red Legs really liked them. And so. We had planned on meeting for lunch after I moved there in July, which I did. So that was kind of funny. It was nice to be published in a national magazine before I got to New York. So with my Peak and Daily Times clippings and my People of Peoria clippings, I now had some national stuff that I could say, you know, I've been published in this magazine. So I met with Legs, had lunch with him. I mean, like the first week I moved there. And we kind of kept in touch. Nerve didn't last long. I think after about half a year, nine months, I never got paid for what I did. Uh, but legs did eventually buy me lunch is what I'll tell you about. Um, but we kind of kept in touch. And like I said, this is in 93. I'd have lunch with him every now and again, or just, just say hi, whatever. Legs, legs was a funny guy. I think if he sees this, he wouldn't mind me saying this. Uh, Glenn Fry once described Joe Walsh as the craziest bunch of guys he'd ever met. And legs was kind of that way. You never knew what you were going to get, but in uh, 96 or 97, this is our, let me see, this is our winter 97 issue, or just say dope issue. And I think that year was the year that Legs and his co-writer, Jillian McCain, came out with a book called Please Kill Me. And this was a, the oral history of punk rock. And it was a great book. And it was an oral history, which I like. And... Uh, did you really like the book? And, and all of a sudden, it was a runaway bestseller and a hit. And they were in Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair. Well, I got hold of legs, and I'm, he knew about fish rap. I said, hey, is there any way that I could do the oral history of the making of Please Kill Me? And he liked the idea. And so he agreed to do it. And I interviewed both him and Jillian, did long interviews. And I was really happy with the piece. Here, here it is. Please, I called mine, Please Read Me. Uh, the uncensored history of the uncensored history of punk rock. And I got some good photos of Jillian legs. There's Jillian holding 
she's actually holding a framed photo of legs. I interviewed both of them at their apartments. Uh, it was a long oral history, and I felt like I did a really good job with it. There's legs in his apartment. I took all these photos. So I thought I did a really good job. But one thing happened with this, though. It was actually a six-page article. Uh, I felt really good about it up to a point. Well, legs, after he did it, it kind of was a coup for me for a fanzine because, like I said, these guys were being written about in Vanity Fair, Rolling Stone. Every major publication did a thing on Please Kill Me. And I was like the only zine that had access to these guys. And no other zine had done anything that I know of, anything monumental other than just write about it. This was huge. So Legs said to me, he said, hey, you know, we haven't really done an interview like this with anybody, including Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair. Uh, I want to see this before you publish it. And normally I wouldn't do that. And I said that to him. I said, you know what? Normally I wouldn't, but all right, I'll, I'll let you see it. So we do it in uh, Fish Wrap. It would take us three to four months to do one issue because these are 48 pages. I had a lot of stories in here, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, this is our, like I said, our Just Say Dope issue. Um, and we did High Times. So I'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, do it, write it up. I'm really happy with it. Now I try to call Legs to set up a time to where he can uh, read the article, and I can't get hold of him. I must have left him a half a dozen messages over the span of like two weeks. And we have a deadline to go to press. We printed a fish wrap at Havana Printing in Havana, Illinois. And they would print it during slow periods and give me a real low printing cost. Well, I had to send it off in like a week. And I haven't heard back from Legs. I gave him one last call. I'm like, Legs, you know, it's Marty. I don't know what you're doing. Uh, but call me. You wanted to read this. I have to go to press in about a week. Didn't hear from him. So now it's at press after about a week or so. We send it in. They send me the proofs, send it back. I think they were printing it right then. Legs calls me. Hey, Marty, it's Legs. You can give me a call. This is on my phone machine. And I'm like, well, and I thought he'd be upset, and he was. So I called him. I said, hey, Legs, it's Marty. Yeah, I, I got your messages. I was out of town. I was in Los Angeles, this and that. Uh, couldn't get back to you, but I want to see that article before you print it. I'm like, it's too late. I told you in the messages we had to go to press with it. Well, he just blew up at me. I can't believe you fucking did this. I told you I want to see this. We didn't give anybody the amount of time that we gave you. If you fuck this up, I, and he goes on and on. Says, I'll talk. I know everybody in this town, and I'll talk against you. And Jess was going on and on. I'm like, legs, you know, there's nothing I can do. It's at press. Well, you fuck this thing up, and you're going to be in big trouble. And, oh, he said something about it. You know, I feel like kicking the shit out of you. And I'm like, oh, I'm not a tough guy, but neither is Legs. And I wonder, I said, Legs, you know where I live. You want to come by and start something? Go right ahead. Well, then he hung up on me. So then I'm thinking, fuck. I called Claire, my friend who I did it with, and told her about it. And I'm like, there's no way Legs is going to like this now. He's going to find something wrong with it. And I really just kind of put a sense of dread. I thought it was one of the best things I had ever done. So anyway, the issue comes out, get it. Again, I'm happy with the layout and everything of it. Let me find it again. I Claire did a great job with the layout. Uh, I thought it looked really good. And I was really happy with the oral history. So reluctantly, I sent one to Legs and to Jillian, put a note to Legs said, sorry, things got messed up. You know, I, I tried with all my might, but I had a deadline and I couldn't miss it. But I said to Claire, I'm like, there's no way he's going to like this. He's going to call me and yell at me. <laughs> and, uh, get a phone call after a couple of days after I mailed it. Hello, I'm Marty's Legs. Now my stomach just like sinks. I'm like, hey, Legs, how you doing? He said, I'm sitting here with Jillian. We both just read your oral history. And I'm thinking, oh, here we go. I'm like, I have famous last words. What would you think? He said, both of us read it and looked at each other and said, Marty is the only guy that truly got it. He's like, this thing is fucking great. You did a wonderful job. I got to give it to Legs. He did. He, he acknowledged that it was good. And I spent a lot of time on it. And I was really happy. So I was so relieved. We ended up having lunch together, kind of made up. I did apologize to him. And he said he, I don't know if he said he shouldn't have gotten mad. But anyway, so that was really a good ending to that. And I'm really happy with that piece in there. We also did the story on High Times. 
And uh, I did an interview with John and Steven in there. I'll put a, the cover uh, thing from that up if I can find it in here. Oh, here it is. Uh, it was the best of times. It was the highest of times. Did a nice interview with them because that was really an alternative publication. There they are sitting at a desk together where I interviewed them at the offices of High Times. That turned out really well. John really liked it. I dropped one off to him at the High Times office. And uh, what's funny, he didn't know Legs was going to be in it. And they've got kind of a spotty history. I don't know where they are now, but I remember he looked right down. And he saw Legs, Legs' picture and he's like, Always hated that guy. <laughs> and that's all he said. So I thought that was funny. So that's in our Just Say Dope issue. I got one other story from this issue, but I feel like this has kind of gone on long enough. I'm going to tell the other story in the next episode. And it's a story about none other, I'll tease you with this, than David Pecker, the guy who has made all kinds of headlines in the whole Donald Trump fiasco. Uh, so I got a story about that next episode. Again, thanks for tuning in. Sorry I missed uh, last week. Try not to do that again. Appreciate all of you that tune in to Spiteful Stories, a division of the Midwest Slice of Life. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next Tuesday. Take care. Thanks again. Thanks again.